thank you for the warm welcome. Um, so uh, we have a project called Camelot, and we'll be telling you what we did this year. Last year we spoke in Birmingham. There we gave a talk uh, about Camelot in general. Uh, this year we'll be speaking about the new beauty. So, um, I'm Jeroen Dieriks. This is my colleague, uh, Erik Janssens. This is uh, our data. Um, I'm going to skip further introduction. Please refer to these links. Our project uses Python and Qt and SQL Alchemy as uh, the main building blocks. Now, maybe a quick show of hands. Uh, who uses Qt? Who uses PyQt? Who uses PySide? Okay, cool. Um, the main website, Python Camelot with a hyphen, and uh, the mailing list can be found on Google Groups. So let's kick off. What is Camelot? Here you can see, well, first of all, Camelot is a framework. It's a framework to develop rich GUI applications, and uh, the speed of development is uh, kind of crucial, as well as um, the ease of use for uh, the, the end user in the other order. So we, uh, we really uh, want to give the end user a good experience. That's what it is. This is how it looks like to define an object, an entity. And as you can see, it's inspired by Django uh, to define the fields in a simple way. Um, here you can see a movie entity, which has a title, a short description, a release date, and a genre. And they are all fields where you specify what type they are, Unicode, date, and so on. Every entity uh, has to have an admin class uh, where you can specify at least, as you can see here, what needs to be displayed in the list. That's basically uh, the, the core of the project. Um, this is what it looks like in Linux. So here you have a um, navigation pane. You have a toolbar. You have tabs. We'll talk about that later. And you uh, get a list with uh, filters, actions. We'll talk about all these. And here you can see the columns that we saw in the code. Cover, title, release date, rating. Uh, and if you click on a row, you get the object itself. We'll see that later on. So um, an important question is, of course, why should one use Camelot? First of all, because it's user and developer friendly. We really spend a lot of time um, looking at users, how they are using the application, and then improving upon it so that uh, it's intuitive for the user to use. And developer friendly, because Camelot, it's a framework, but we try to make it a framework that you can customize without the need to monkey patch. So it it's exists out of a set of base classes, and you can always subclass one of those classes, re-implement some of its methods to customize the behavior, and then inject this class back into your application so you can customize things without, without, without using dirty tricks. It's based on, on Qt and SQL Alchemy, which are both uh, very mature libraries. So with Qt, you can develop cross-platform applications, uh, which are very, very nice to use. And SQL Alchemy is, is without doubt, it's the, the best ORM for, for Python that you can get. It has a lot of very advanced features. And, and this is very useful if you start a small application. But once your application grows, you will need more advanced features. And those are all in SQL Alchemy. So that's, that's very good to know if you start developing an application. It's also a very productive environment to develop applications in. If you have an ID for a database application, it, you can go very fast from just from ID to, to implementation. 
That's because it's based on, on um, the Django admin interface, how Django works. So that's also very productive. So we, we took a lot of ideas from it uh, that we reused in Camelot. And the application is multi-threaded from the start. Now, why is this important? In, in Camelot, we have a GUI thread, which runs basically all the QT stuff. And we have a model thread, which runs all the SQL Alchemy stuff. And this means if, if you have a query that is, uh, that is a little bit slow, or there is a network connection that is slow, or a, a file is opening slow, or it's a very large file, your application will never freeze. So there is always a first level of security against freezing of applications because of the separation of the model in one thread and the GUI in the other thread. Um, and Camelot was developed from day one with multi-threading in mind. So as you all know, it's, it's very difficult to implement multi-threading in an, in an application that was not designed this way. But don't believe Eric's word uh, on how, uh, of how do, why you should use Camelot. Here are some quotes, mainly from uh, the mailing list, because that's one of our main uh, communication channels. Mr. Jay Foley says, Camelot is proving to be a great software development environment. This quote is not new. So is proving to be, I think, maybe it's uh, already proven. Um, Jens on the mailing list, we uh, couldn't find his last name. Maybe he is here? No? Uh, but we, we wanted to put it in here because, you know, it's just fun to use. If, if a user, if, if someone uses your software and says it's fun to use, you know, makes it, uh, that's, that's fun. That's nice to hear. Enjoyment, yeah. Um, looks really promising. And Mr. Kaiser says, I'm already able to build desktop applications at warp speed, just as promised. So um, let's, so with this introductory, uh, we can start the talk. Let's just uh, say what we're going to talk about. Um, we split this talk up in two big parts, uh, new features and lessons learned. Lessons learned is uh, at the back, not, uh, it's, it's the smallest uh, um, part. The new features are, as you can see, tap-based desktop displaying queries, table view, dynamic field attributes, actions with options, and matplotlib integration. And then at the end, we'll talk about uh, what we learned this year. Um, we had a lot of deployments. We had a lot of, uh, we had a couple of uh, successful uh, commercial applications on top of Camelot, which, um, well, we'll discuss uh, what we learned from that and how it affected our development model and how we uh, 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 sharpened our tools. Um, So, yeah, okay. First up, tap-based desktop. We used to have uh, an application with separate windows. Uh, we looked at the users and they didn't get it. So we switched to tabs. Uh, every browser these days has it, so it's intuitive. Users, uh, they know it uh, at, the, at the snap of a finger. So, um, let's see it work. Note this is... Uh, um, Mac. This runs in a Mac. Uh, we had Linux screenshots. We have uh, Windows movies in this presentation. It's all real. So let's see what happens. So you see, we have a home tab. It's always there. You can't close it because it can contain actions, application actions. Here you see it's, a, it's to create a new movie. Opens up a new window, you have a form to create the new movie. I'm not going to do anything here. Uh, you can open another tab, like the movie list. You can see, now you have two tabs. The home tab is always there. And the movie tab is also consultable. If you right click, you can open a tab in a new window. Uh, in, uh, you can open uh, a list in a new tab, sorry. And you can easily switch between them. 
you can close a tab. And if you double click on a tab, it maximizes. Note, because this is um, on a Mac, we still have the, the main menu, file, edit, view, help. On Windows, this disappears. Um, so you get maximum view. OK, so one of the new features of Camelot is the ability to display query results. So um, until last year, you could easily display and edit uh, tables in a database. But now you can also define queries and then display and edit those. So how does that work? Suppose we have a, a very simple model here. We have uh, movies. And a movie has a, a director, which is a person. So there's a link between movie and person. And then we have visitor reports, which is um, the number of visitors that went to look at a movie on a specific date. So we have a relation between visitor report and movies. Now suppose we want to, um, to show to the user how many visitors went to a movie of a certain director without doing this in some kind of, of report, but directly into the GUI. So this is how, how it looks like in code. We have a person with two fields, a first name and a last name, a movie with a director, which refers to the person, and then we have a visitor report, which refers to the movie, and has a field visitors with yeah, the number of visitors. So to display um, the result that we want in, uh, in Camelot, we first need an object, because Camelot works on objects that are mapped through SQL Alchemy. So we just define a visitors per director object with a, a little admin interface to, to tell it which fields we want to display in the list. But we don't define fields in here because there's actually no, no table behind, behind these objects. So um, all the attributes of this, of this object will be put there by SQL Alchemy. We just tell it to display those attributes in the list. So how do we proceed then? First, we create a select statement in SQL Alchemy. So we say select, and then we say which fields we want in our select statement. That's from, from line four to line seven. So we take the person, uh, the primary key of person, which is party ID. We take his first name, his last name. We take the sum of all the visitors. And then we specify the where clause on line nine where we say we want the persons that are associated with a movie as a director, and we take the visitor reports which are associated with the movie. And then we group this, uh, this result set by the person fields because we want to group everything um, by director. Notice that you don't have to specify from which tables you're selecting. That's something SQL Alchemy will, will do for you. Um, and then we map this, this, uh, this select statement that's in line 18. We map this select statement to our visitors per director object. Um, you can see that you don't need to specify the primary key SQL Alchemy has to use for uh, mapping this, this result set to the object because it will, SQL Alchemy will be smart enough to take the person party ID for it. If, if your uh, select statements are more difficult or you have compound primary keys, then it might be needed to specify those. And we also tell it to always refresh uh, its mapping. This means that every time the, the query will be executed, SQL Alchemy will update the values, the attribute values of the mapped objects. Okay, that's all we have to do. And we put this in the in the in the user interface, and you get this nice uh, resulting, this nice table that you can use. So, little slide about table views. Also a movie. Uh, just to demonstrate, we have frozen columns. Column one here, the cover column. It uh, stays frozen while you can scroll the other uh, columns. Just uh, something new, we would, we would uh, like to show you how easy it is to specify this in the admin, list, frozen, list columns frozen, and specify the amount of, uh, the number of columns you want to freeze. Then dynamic field attributes. Uh, what are field attributes in Camelot? 
uh, field attributes are uh, they specify how Camelot should render a certain field uh, in the in the graphical user interface. So for each field, you can specify a number of attributes um, like minimum or maximum or precision, which is the numbers behind the decimal point, or you can specify the suffix. Now, all those attributes, they can be static, like you say, for example, the suffix is always M for meter, but those field attributes can also be dynamic. This means you can, you can use a function as a field attribute, and then Camelot will evaluate this function for each object and will um, change the field attributes according to the result of this function. Now, until last year, this only worked for like two field attributes, like tooltip and background color. But as of uh, as of the last release, this works for most of the of the field attributes. So, um, in this example, we'll demonstrate a financial product. A financial product is something like a, it can be a savings account. So, we made a, a financial product called the Python Investment, and a financial product can have certain features like interest rate. It can have an, an entry fee, a minimum number of days uh, your money needs to be in the savings account. And we will we'll just show you how easy it is with those dynamic field attributes to make a very simple data structure to define very complex uh, products. So this is the list of all the features of a certain financial product. And then we'll, we'll, you see that each feature has a different suffix, a different precision, and it can have a different background color as well. So here is uh, the form of, of one of those features. And you see, the, um, this is the, the drop-down box with the feature. And if you change the feature, you see that the value, the, um, the suffix of the value changes as well as its, uh, its precision. and its tooltip as well. And its background can change as well depending on, on the value you entered. For example, if you entered values that are probably bogus, like uh, interest rates that are, that are too high, if you're not living in Greece, this is probably not true. So how do you implement such thing? First of all, um, you define an enumeration of features so the, here in line one until three, we have this enumeration where one, two, and three will be the values that are stored in the database. And then the user will see interest rate, tax rate, or entry fee. Then we define a feature class where we can have many features for one product. Um, and a feature has a name, which, which is uh, what's uh, specified in the enumeration. And it can have a value, which is a, a numeric field. So how to introduce the dynamic field attributes? We, we extend the feature table a little bit, so we add for each feature a specific suffix. And then we create a function on line 8, value suffix, which gives the suffix that should be used for a certain feature depending on, on the name of the feature. And then in line 18, we tell Camelot to use this value suffix function as the field attribute for suffix for the value field. And then every time the, um, the name of the feature changes, Camelot will evaluate this function and change the suffix of the value. And to make this uh, more complex, we can add, for example, a threshold at uh, the last column of our features table. And this will define when, when a feature becomes probably invalid. And then we create a value background color function, which will return the the background color of the value depending on, on the value itself. Um, so notice that there is this uh, color scheme class. This color scheme class contains all the colors of the Tango color team. So if you use colors from this class, you're certain that they, uh, they map well to the, um, to the interface. And then again in the field attributes, we say the background color of the value can be get from the value background color function. And this way you can, you can very easily create uh, something to configure complex products. And also if you, have, if you need new features for a product, it's just adding one line in the table and you're done. 
So, for example, in, 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 this, uh, in this application, we have more than 20 features, and every month users ask new features, and it's just a little bit of work for us to, to add them. Another area where we uh, did a lot of work this year is actions. Quick overview. Actions can have uh, a different context. They can work on lists, forms, and the entire application. And you can... Uh, uh, the ac uh, and um, actions can run in the model or in the GUI thread. An example of this is the docx form action, which we uh, use a lot. The clients uh, really appreciate this. Uh, it's a way to uh, generate Word XML and open them directly in Word. So the client can have a nice report, uh, which he can... Uh, later edit uh, if you want. So here's this in action. You have the action buttons there, one of which is account state. If I click it, a Word document opens, which can be layouted by somebody else. <laughs> and uh, you can see it's still Word, so the user can, uh, can uh, always Edit it. Is the template uh, uh, fixable or you can uh, change it? Yes. Uh, the style of the document. No, no, no. That's, that's just custom. You make whatever. You take, actually, you take a Word document, you create a Word document in Word, you save it as a .xml file, mm -hmm. and then you, you run it through XML lint to clean it a bit, and then you create your template from it. Uh, but Jeroen will explain. Uh, yes. So let's see how it works. So you create uh, an object which uh, extends docx form action available in Camelot. And you uh, create a context. The context here contains the uh, variables uh, or the placeholders um, where you assign the values to. So we have here today, which has a date. Uh, account is an object. Subscribers can be a list. Uh, correspondent can be a list too. Um, you specify a get template uh, method, which just gets uh, the XML file, uh, which you probably got from your client. And uh, you load up the environment, uh, which speaks for itself, I think. Um, you can use any environment. We mostly use Jinja. Quick sample of, of how the XML looks like, a Word XML file, uh, where you can uh, place the placeholder, which will get uh, um, filled in. Here we use Jinja, like I said. Uh, we use the today um, label and we uh, run it th through a Jinja filter date to nicely uh, format it. Another very cool feature uh, which uh, a lot of clients love is uh, the document merger, which is in Camelot for free. Um, you make a document like, uh, like um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, here I'm, I made a small document with uh, some placeholders, and I use the OBG OBJ uh, object um, to get the the specific fields uh, from the object. Uh, we have title, uh, we have director, uh, and so on. Of course, little magic needs to be done with XML lint to uh, to, to get Word to play nice with these uh, these tags. Uh, let's see it in action, I think. Yes. Like I said, we use these placeholders, these uh, ginger placeholders here. We start from that. Um, here I open up the, the movies list. I select three movies. Go to edit, merge document and select the uh, XML file that I just showed you. 
click next. And three documents are generated because I selected three movies. Each movie, each document will now contain the information about this, the movie. So you see everything is uh, nicely replaced. And to show you I'm not cheating, this is the, the other movie, the second movie, Casino Royale. And finally, third movie, Toy Story. Document merge. Your clients will love it. Then we have um, another example, which are list actions with, with options. So list actions are actions that um, appear on the, on the right-hand corner of the table view. There's a button, you can click on it, and um, something happens, like in this case, uh, generating a report. You see when, when you click on it, the, uh, the action asks uh, some information from the user. For example, here you, the user has to say if he wants on his report only the selected uh, rows in the table view or all the rows. And that changes the behavior of the, of the action. So I will now uh, quickly demonstrate how to build those actions. So um, generating a report is something that happens inside the model thread because you need ac uh, access to the database. So you just subclass uh, a class named list action from model function. That's, that's a base class in Camelot. And it has an important method, method which is model run. It has three arguments, collection, that's all the rows in the table view the, the user is looking at. Selection is an iterator over, uh, over all the um, selected rows. And then there's the third argument, options, which we'll discuss uh, right away. So to create your own action, you just subclass list action for model function, implement the model run method. In this simple case, we just print all the objects in the selection and then add an instance of the my list action object to the list actions of the, of the admin. That's it. Then the action is now there. And now we'll demonstrate how to use options uh, before running the actions. So what you then have to do is to specify a, an inner class, options, of the action class. When Camelot sees this option class, it will pop up a form uh, in front of the user when he presses the button and it will ask the user to complete this form and then continue with the action. So this demonstrates as well the, the possibility of Camelot to, to work with uh, objects that are not mapped to the database. So this is just a, a plain old Python object. It has uh, one attribute only selected and we, we give it an, an admin class to tell Camelot how to display this object. And then in the model run method, the third argument, options, will be an instance of the, of the options with a capital class um, with the values entered by the user. And then you can use these options inside the, the, the run method to either, in this case, print the objects that were selected or print all the objects. So that's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a quite common pattern uh, in this kind of applications to have just this options dialog and it's, it's very fast uh, to create it this way. Next we have matplotlib integration. Um, this is a plot in matplotlib. Okay. So how does that work? Um, matplotlib works with a, a set of plot commands. Um, and those plot commands are executed on access objects. Access objects are access that, uh, in, a, in, a, in a chart. And the way Camelot works, because we have two threads, we have the model thread and the GUI thread. In the model thread, we have to aggregate all the data we want to, we want to put on the plot. And then in the, in the GUI thread, we'll make the actual plot really fast so that uh, there is no slowdown for the user. So how does, it work? how does it work? In the model thread, we are going to record all plot commands to matplotlib. So we created a fake matplotlib access object. You call all commands on this access object. They are recorded. And then 
they are shipped, they are recorded and stored in what we call a container. This container is shipped to the GUI thread, and in the GUI thread, we just execute those commands with all the data already fetched, so that goes really fast. So that that's, sounds more complicated than it is. This is an example of it, to display um, a chart on, the, on um, a form. You just have to create an ad, a property, in this case chart, which returns uh, a container that contains all the commands for matplotlib. And then in the field attributes, you say this property chart needs to be displayed with a chart delegate, and then this, this just acts as a, normal, uh, as a normal field, like a float or an integer, but in this case, a chart. Um, and then inside the chart property, we return a plot container. A plot container is a very simple container for matplotlib. It takes as its arguments, as its construction arguments, all the arguments you can give to the matplotlib plot function. So that's really easy to create simple plots. The first plot you saw was, was created with, uh, with this function. Um, you can create more complex plots as well. Uh, in this plot, you have a, a vertical span, and there are uh, grid lines. I don't think you can see them, but uh, they are there. Um, yeah. So you see in this uh, chart method, we create an access container object, and then we call various functions on this access container. The container stores all the actions, all the functions you called, uh, along with the arguments, and then you ship the access container to the GUI thread, and the chart delegate takes care of, of displaying the matplotlib figure. So, how we did in the real world. This uh, concludes the, the new features. Now we'll talk a bit about uh, what we learned last, uh, well, the past year in the real world <clears throat> by dealing with clients. So that's us, our team, young, happy, you know, vibrant bunch. And this is us after 100 deployments. So deploying uh, deployment for a desktop application uh, is somewhat different than web apps, for example. So, But notice how cool we're still, though. So how do we do it? So one of the things we did was, um, what I think we did wrong was we were using a Py to exe to deploy our application. So what we did, we just downloaded a custom uh, stock Python uh, from the website. We uh, downloaded various libraries from the websites, installed them, and then used Py to exe to create a bundle of the application, and then prayed that it would work uh, on the site of the customer, which was almost never the case. So what did we do? We created our own Python distribution from source for all the binary libraries we needed. Um, this was a lot of work, but uh, what, we what we can do if, if we did this, we have one installer which installs our own Python distribution it's a distribution that doesn't depend on registry settings, so it does not interfere with already installed Pythons or something else. And then to deploy an application, we just add or little module the application itself to the Python distribution, ship the Python distribution with the right entries in the menu, in the Windows Start menu, and we're done. And all the libraries you use, um, they just, they just work because you're using them in a Python distribution and not in some changed environment like py, py to exit, so you don't need to use dirty tricks and all this kind of stuff. We were able to, um, to compile all the libraries with the options that we wanted, like SQL Alchemy, with the C extensions to get more speed up, the same for Jinja. Um, and when there still is a, an issue, we can fire up a Python interpreter at the at the site or just use the, the spider IDE, which we included, to edit some configuration files. And this all saved us a, a tremendous amount of time in, in deploying. And, and you can get this, uh, this Python distribution from the website.
for a little bit of Windows text. So we also changed our, our development model a, a little bit. So in our development model, you had like three parties that were involved. You had the developers, us. You had the domain expert who knows everything about what the application should do. And then you had the users. There are many of them. We don't know them. We're a little bit scared of them. Um, so. so how do we do our development now? We have the, the domain experts, which give input to the developers. The developers modify and create the application. And then we have BuildBot that makes nightly builds. And those nightly builds are through an automatic updating system immediately installed on the PC of the, of the domain experts so they can follow really quickly on what we're doing. And, they, and so we have a, a very good feedback loop. Then when, um, when both domain experts and developers think, OK, the application is at a state that it can be released, a release is pushed through the automatic update system to the PC of the users. And the PCs of the users, they give logs back to us, to our logging database, so we can see if there are exceptions happening at the site of the users, and we can fix uh, the application before the user has noticed something went wrong. To accomplish this, we had we uh, built it, uh, or Eric uh, built a small tool, which is called Cloud Launch. It's a uh, it's a terminal tool. Uh, it's, it doesn't have a GUI, and it's tightly uh, integrated with uh, setup tools. So you can see here, uh, we can build an egg with BDIS Cloud, and we can build a Windows installer with uh, Winnings Cloud. Pretty st straightforward and easy for the, us. The, the egg is a little bit special okay. in the sense that it contains metadata about the application on how to update itself and, and, and this kind of things. Well, the egg doesn't. <laughs> It's a different file. It's a cloud file, a CLD file we use uh, to uh, store a dictionary. Uh, well, it's a, it's a JSON object, uh, which contains all the information about uh, this update, uh, revision numbers. We use revision numbers to see if a client needs an update. Uh, every time he starts the application, goes to see uh, whether uh, uh, he can find a cloud file, and then check with his own file, and then uh, it'll download uh, the egg. The application restarts. The new egg is loaded, and update is done. Works very well. Uh, the other nice feature is that we can monitor our clients. So you can see here in the second uh, command, we use setup.py monitor cloud, and we get nice info about what the users are doing and how it's uh, how it's failing. <laughs> So that's it. That was our talk about new features and uh, what we learned this year. Camelot, again, our data. Um, maybe um, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, there is a course planned on SQL Alchemy and Camelot in Germany, which uh, will be taught by Eric. Um, it's in. It's somewhere in October. The data is on the website. Yes. I don't Please consult uh, pythoncamelot.com for, uh, for more information about that. And uh, I will put the slides online soon. Uh, I mean today. <laughs> so thank you very much. And if there are any questions, please. In the example, you use docx to export. Can you also export as ODT? And for merging, you use Office to generate XML. Is that needed? Uh, it can work with OpenOffice as well. It's just we, we're just using Jinja yeah. to merge the templates. So it, it could be done with, uh, with OpenOffice as well. Unfortunately, most of uh, our users are using okay. uh, yeah, just wondering. Uh, Word. <laughs> So um, actually, in a commercial application that I've been doing at work, I've written something which is almost identical to what you guys have done. It's not quite as general or as complete as yours, but it's the same basic idea. Um, I was wondering if you've already got a big 
SQL Alchemy model and it's all set up all nicely and I say I wanted to use one of your fancy table views, can I, can I use your product as a, as a library and say, you, with this SQL Alchemy object, display me this beautiful widget? Or if, if you have SQL Alchemy objects, then, you, then it can be done, yes. Okay. yes. If, if you just uh, have a, a relational database and you're using, uh, like, uh, you can use SQL Alchemy to, to extract uh, objects from it, uh, I don't know. I don't think that that would be the purpose of the application. Okay. But if you have a SQL Alchemy set of objects, it can be done, yes. Yeah, that's right. Just a question about licensing. How do you handle the, the PyQt GPL license uh, on on the on with your clients mostly, uh, especially as de deployment? Uh, well, we we have uh, the Camelot itself is GPL, yeah, like PyQt, yeah, and we have a commercial PyQt license. Uh, and so that doesn't cause any. So you you don't have any look at PySide, for example, thinking about switching for that for specific well, clients or. Um, we, well, when we decide between PyQt or PySite, if, if it's really a decision, we will decide on, on technical merits of, of both frameworks. Um, that being said, there is a script inside the source distribution which converts Camelot to PySite. Um, it was not really working properly with, with PySite 1.0 because there were still some bugs in PySite, but I, I believe they have been fixed, but I didn't try it, uh, it afterwards. Um, with the distribution you built yourself, how easy is it to, uh, how, how auto automated is it? Like, if you want to upgrade libraries or Python, etc. It's how, uh, the, is the distribution is a is a um, it's a Python script, of course, and it downloads all the um, all the sources from the various websites and builds it all in one step. So, um, if you want to upgrade the library, it's just uh, up updating the download location for the source files, and that's it. Um, in the booklet, it mentions that this intends to be a kind of replacement to Microsoft Access. Um, do you know of uh, a case in which they decided to port an application either or stop using Microsoft Access? Um, or, there, there, or, is, there is one, one blog on the Internet uh, from, from uh, I don't remember the name of the person who wrote it, um, but he, he saw it as a replacement to, to Microsoft Access. We never really, really started with, with that idea in mind, but it appears that, um, yeah, you can replace Microsoft Access applications with Camelot, but we see Camelot as something different from Access because the development model is, is completely di different. It's not drag and drop. It's, it's writing code and, and using the full power of Python to, uh, to generate your stuff. Do you support the localization? Excuse me? Do you support uh, localization? Yes, the... yes, 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 of course, yes. Okay. Yeah, we demonstrated this last year. There is even the option if, you, if, you have, if you're running a Camelot application and there is a field name, the user can right-click on the field name and change the translation himself. So that, that's really handy if, if you're deploying to, to multiple languages. And then you can ask a user to translate the application, extract the PO file from it, and ship it uh, next time. Any more questions? Did you have issues with uh, SQL Alchemy? Because we used it in the past, and I remember we have some glitches with change of version, 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Even with minor versions, some features were slightly different. So we ran into the troubles. So maybe we were using some uh, strange feature. Or what's your experience with SQL Alchemy in general as stability? Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy with SQL Alchemy. Indeed, we, had, we have those issues as well. So every time there is a new version of SQL Alchemy, we have to go over the code and look very carefully what is happening. Um, my, my experience is that it's just understanding SQL Alchemy is, is difficult. I mean, you can use it like, like here in, or with Elixir on top. It's very simple. It's like, like the Django or uh, system. 
but it's it's really as something completely different. I don't see it as only as an as an ORM, or as a, you, you don't have to see it as a tool to write SQL queries in Python, because you you could have written SQL as well. I, I more see it as a tool to manipulate queries, and and just a different perspective. But I, I'm very happy with uh, with it. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you.